Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming along to my presentation. I'll be taking on a journey this afternoon to the Transantarctic Mountains of Antarctica and I'll be explaining what's so fascinating about the fossils I've discovered from there. Um, I will first be talking about the brachiopods of the Neptune range and why they're interesting, the tomatoes of the Shackleton limestone and the tomatoes of the Argentina range, and then I'll be trying to wrap things up in a coherent summary that explains the evolution, hopefully, of this entire large group. Well, first of all, what are lophotrochozoans? It's a very interesting question. Um, there are many uh, very familiar groups of uh, animals which are members of the lophotrochozoans, for example, the annelids and the, uh, the mollusks. And there are, very, uh, there are other more uh, unusual groups, for example, in the Mertians, the brachypods and the foranids. Uh, and it's the brachypods and the foranids I am particularly interested in. So, sorry, people who work on the annelids and mollusks. Why Antarctica, though? Why should we go to Antarctica to look at these things? Uh, it's a fact that 98% of the continent is now covered in ice and snow, leaving only a paltry 2% uh, for analysis. Um, but Antarctica is the last wilderness of fossil collection, and its remoteness makes it particularly interesting. Um, in the, the Cambrian, Antarctica was situated on the equator. It was connected to Australia and India in the East Gondwanan province, and was associated with the active East uh, Gondwanan margin of the Paleo-Pacific uh, Ocean. Uh, there was a very large carbonate shelf which existed in this region at the time, which I've indicated by the uh, green uh, rectangle here. Um, and this was the main focus of my research, although uh, I will also be talking about uh, other associated areas on the East Gondwanan margin. Uh, other re uh, people have looked at uh, Antarctica over the years, but most of the research has focused on spot samples, uh, for example, erratics or moraine boulders, and it's only really been in recent years that we've actually properly looked at large stratigraphic sequences, as I have. Uh, one of my first areas uh, of study uh, was the Pensacola Mountains. I then moved on to the Churchill Mountains. In the Pensacola Mountains, uh, I particularly focused on the Neptune Range. And the stratigraphy of the Neptune Range. The main, my main focus in the Neptune Range was the Nelson Limestone, uh, which uh, is a middle Cambrian uh, limestone sequence. Uh, it's of Drumian Age, which we know based on correlations uh, based on trilobites, and the correlations are with uh, other parts of Antarctica and Australia as well. So we're talking sort of a late Middle Cambrian age. I found many species of brachiopods uh, when I dissolved the limestone blocks from the Nelson limestone uh, and put the, put the small microfossils under the SEM. These ones in particular have strong links uh, with basins in Australia. Uh, these green basins are from basins that formed uh, on the margin uh, of the East uh, Gondwanan province. Uh, there were fewer similarities with the intercrotonic basins shaded in red uh, or the basins which formed on the flanks of island arcs uh, shaded in blue. Uh, in Australia, uh, the, green, uh, the fossils from the green basins are slightly older than in Ant uh, Antarctica, which perhaps suggests that the Nelson limestone is, is a relic fauna uh, that uh, remained uh, in Antarctica whilst uh, other examples in other parts of the world became extinct. Uh, other fossils from Antarctica were more similar to fossils from India, for example, the Spiti region, uh, stage five, uh, in the Parahio Valley. Other fossils were more like fossils from other parts of Antarctica, for example, the uh, separate, in the Cambrian, uh, West, uh, West Antarctic province uh, and North Victoria land. So some of these fossils had quite a, a wide ge uh, geographical distribution, uh, which is interesting because it suggests that there was uh, some spatial separation uh, involved in, these, uh, in the distribution of the fossils. Uh, I then moved on to look at the importance of small shelly fossils. Uh, small shelly fossils are interesting because they record uh, the first uh, major evidence, we first major characteristic evidence of bilaterians um, in the fossil record. Um, they were originally described in the 1960s when it was believed that they were all uh, secondarily phosphatic, they were all small and they were all from the lower Cambrian. Nowadays, we know they're not all necessarily small, but not all necessarily phosphatic, uh, and some of them rage upwards into, the, uh, into other parts of the Cambrian as well. I focused on the Tomotis, which are a very interesting group of small shelly fossils. Um, they're united by their organophosphatic structure and their dense uh, lamination. Uh, they formed by accretion, uh, either basal accretion or marginal accretion. And they can be roughly separated into two groups, uh, the Acentrophecomorphs, uh, which are believed to be uh, ancestral to the foreignids, and the Caymanellans, which include Caymanella, Daliacea, Canardia, and Laprophella. Uh, and these are more basal uh, and much more primitive. Usually, um, in small shelly fossils, we, uh, we don't find articulated organisms. We simply find elements which are just disartic uh, disarticulated. Um, so we don't really have any idea of what a full 
small shelly organism might actually look like. In some very rare cases, though, we have found articulated organisms. Halkeria is one example. A centrifica is another. Uh, as I mentioned, the centrifica is a much more advanced uh, tomotid. Um, but we've been able to reconstruct it as a, a tubular sessile organism with a loaf fall which waved in, in the water current uh, to pick up detritus. As I said, it was a much more uh, advanced organism than the organisms which I'm interested in, which are Daliacea and Canardia. So what do, what do these organisms look like? What, do, what does Daliacea look like? Uh, Daliacea has three separate uh, forms of sclerites. It has the A sclerite, which is symmetrical, the B sclerite, which is twisted uh, and rather saddle-like, and it has a C sclerite, which is twisted but rather conical or, or cone-shaped. This may bring to mind a certain other group of organisms. Um, when it comes to examining tomatoes, we are uh, where the cone researchers were in the early half of the 20th century. We haven't found yet a complete Caymanellan tomatid organism, so we don't quite know exactly what they look like. Um, all we're left with are sort of the uh, disarticulated elements, uh, which, based on their associations, we can begin to perhaps reconstruct what we think a Caymanellan organism might look like. And how do we do this? One principle is location. If we can find different groups of sclerites from the same location, we, begin, we can begin to say that perhaps they were from the same organism. If those sclerites then have very similar ornamentation, as you can see here in Daliacea ajax, is this poly polygonal uh, micro-ornamentation structure, that's further evidence that perhaps they were from the same organism, just different parts of the same organism. In other tomatoes, we're very lucky to find sclerites that were uh, fused in, during development. So we can see in uh, these sclerites, the AB sclerite was formed from fusion of A and B sclerites. This AC sclerite was formed from the fusion of A and C sclerites. This is very rare, but it, this gives us a good indication that these sclerites are part of the same organism. And this is what we think nowadays the uh, Cayman and Tomotid organism probably look like. Uh, this is very interesting because it implies that at some point uh, on the brachypod stem lineage, there was a transition from a vermiform armoured slug-like organism to a sessile tube-like organism. I looked at the Shackleton limestone to examine these tomatids uh, from the Churchill Mountains. Uh, this is stage three to stage four of the Cambrian, uh, again based on archaeocyphs and trilobites. Uh, and the Caymanellans from this location uh, were of four types, apparently. Daliacea bradicae, Daliacea odyssei, uh, and Canardia, uh, both SPA and SPB. Uh, this research was done in the early 1990s, and I've since been able to re reprise some of this data. I found a separate Daliacea species, uh, which uh, was, this, was, this species uh, was very similar, almost identical to what was referred to as Daliacea spa from the Aru Basin of Australia. Um, and in Australia it co-occurred co alongside Daliacea odyssey, and the exact same pattern I found in the Shackleton limestone of Antarctica, which I believe gave me some very strong indication that the two areas uh, overlapped in terms of age. I looked at Canardia as well. Um, I did wonder about SPA because SPA was described uh, only based on one single very badly preserved sclerite. All of these sclerites seem to have a very similar uh, morphology, sort of this uh, the system of peaks and troughs, and a very similar ornamentation, which was this uh, ribbed uh, rectangular style of ornamentation, which is very similar to Daliacea ajax from Australia. So perhaps this canaria could actually be a Daliacea. Another piece of evidence towards that was that this canaria from Antarctica looked absolutely nothing like the canaria from Australia. Looking again at some more uh, uh, sclerites that weren't previously analysed, I was able to see even more morphological variation. Uh, Ebrin sclerites that have the same uh, noded rectangular uh, ornamentation. Uh, this does fit into the uh, A, B and C pattern that we see in other uh, species of Daliacea, so I think this is most likely to be a species of Daliacea. But unfortunately, I just don't have the number of specimens to adequately describe uh, a new species at this present time. I also looked at the Schneid Hills limestone, uh, just north of the Pensacola Mountains. Uh, the Schneid Hills limestone is unofficially described, uh, so it only has uh, an unofficial name at the moment. Um, it is believed to underlie uh, lateral equivalents of the Nelson limestone, which is very interesting. Um, it's also believed to be uh, an equivalent of uh, part of the Shackleton limestone, sort of the, the northern equivalent, and be part of the same uh, belt uh, of a, uh, the Carbonate province. Uh, it, it's believed to be Botomian in age. This was based on the uh, Archaeocyph ages uh, from a single, single spot sample, so it's difficult to say for sure. But at least some elements of the, of the Schneider Hills limestone overlapped in ages uh, with the Shackleton limestone. I found some new sclerites in the Schneider Hills limestone. 
um, a B sclerite, C1 sclerite, and a C2 sclerite. Um, they have uh, a very similar uh, morphology, at least the C1 and C2 sclerites do. They have this sort of elongated lip uh, in apical view. Uh, all the sclerites have this kind of uh, square shaped or slightly rectangular uh, ornamentation. Uh, and they all have these, uh, again, peaks and troughs, uh, but they're less defined. Uh, they're not quite so, quite so raised. Um, I've compared these sclerites to all other kinds of daliaceous sclerites um, I can possibly find from literature, and these seem to be completely unique. Um, daliacea was previously noted uh, from this location, but I'm the first person to analyse and look at these in great detail. So I can say that there's a new species. Uh, and why is that interesting? Well, if this overlaps in age with the Shackleton limestone, and I can see absolutely no similarities in fauna, uh, similarities with the Shackleton limestone, it suggests that there was a, a spatial element of distribution in the tomatids. So unlike the brachiopods, which um, in the middle Cambrian were very similar across a, a huge and a very wide-ranging area, um, the tomatids seem to be much more, uh, much more distinct in separate, in separate areas. One more thing, as my main man Columbo would like to say. I may have possibly found a tomatid from the Nelson limestone. Um, I analysed over a thousand microfossils uh, from the Nelson limestone, sponges, brachypods, uh, trilobites, and I found one, one tomatid sclerite. Um, you might not think this is great evidence, but it has, this sclerite has uh, a great number of morphological uh, similarities with other tomatids, for example, Daliacea ajax from Australia. It has the same system of uh, ridges and troughs. Uh, it is hollow, uh, it's phosphatic. Um, it has a cross section which is very similar to Daliacea. Um, so I believe it's given me strong evidence to say that uh, in Antarctica, at least, some Cayman and entomotids ranged through into stage six, uh, the late Middle Cambrian, which is interesting because it pushes the entire group of tomatids into the late Middle Cambrian and suggests that there was a, a patchwork uh, of evolutionary features um, which evolved. So in summary, the early tomotid uh, diversity in the Shackleton limestone has been underestimated. There's at least one other species in there. Uh, a new species of Daliacea from the early Cambrian Argentina range suggests that spatial separation was an important factor in the early diversity of tomotids. Uh, so tomotids uh, were much more diverse than previously assumed. Uh, Tomotid from Nelson limestone suggests that stem group Lophotrochozoans ranged up to the end of the Middle Cambrian, uh, a diverse evolutionary patchwork of innovations. So rather than simply being a stepwise uh, sequence from uh, primitive tomotids to advanced brachiopods, we can see that uh, some Caymanellan, uh, apparently more basal tomotids, uh, may have survived to live alongside the more advanced brachiopods. Uh, the Nelson limestone shares many species of Australian and Indian sections, uh, but these species are younger in Antarctica, which suggests that the Nelson limestone may have been a, form, uh, a relic fauna. Acknowledgements, uh, constructive criticism and assistance from Leonid Popov, uh, Albert Rao, Bruce Lieberman, Patrick Smith, Taylor Park and others. Uh, and I'd, I'd very much like to thank the Swedish Research Council uh, for giving a grant to my supervisor, Lars Holmer. Thank you very much.